Hello everyone, Siri here, and it is time for another Specimen Saturday. And I was really excited, we're getting ready to move, and I've been really excited digging through all of my specimens, and there's so many cool things I want to show you guys. And among some of my favorite specimens are my seashells. And we've talked a little bit about corals in the past when we looked at corals, I think two or three weeks ago, and how amazing that those tiny micro-communities of any bitty, any bitty little individual cells, like the individual little microscopic organisms that build coral reefs are and today we're going to talk about their close cousins the seashells which are made by mollusks and I actually have a huge selection of seashells in my personal opinion I try to get a little bit that represents a whole big swath of the world but first off what is a seashell a seashell is actually the shell the exoskeleton of a mollusk and so a mollusk will be things like your snails clams and those kinds of invertebrates species that instead of having bones on their insides they actually will make their own exoskeletons to provide that protection so the whole point of a seashell like these guys is to provide protection from predators so if I was a little mollusk living up inside of this seashell I'd be very happy because I would have this huge interior where I would burrow down into I would live inside there and this would be my shell that would protect me and so whenever a predator tried to come and eat me, and I'm just a squishy, boneless little thing, there's this hard shell. Like, it's really hard. It would be difficult for... I wouldn't be able to get into this without smashing it open, for example. And that's what otters have to do when they eat uh, clams, is they have to pick the clams up and smash them against rocks or between rocks in order to crack them open to get to the food inside. And so this is great protection. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort to try to get into a mollusk. Mollusks don't really move a lot. Uh, they're pretty sedentary. Most of these guys are just going to burrow down into the sand and they're just going to be there or they're totally stuck in place the way that the coral pieces are because these are, this is also uh, a calcium exoskeleton that we've got right here, this coral piece. And so what you see with the, di the diversity of seashells is the same thing, is that calcium exoskeleton represented in a wide range of different colors, shapes, sizes, patterning. It's very amazing. I love it. I love seashells. And seashells have been around for so long, and they have actually been something that people have been fascinated with for as far back as we can really trace the history of a semi-civilized any kind of tribal group. There has been evidence of seashells used in like collections, in little relic pieces, just people gathering up pretty shells and keeping them as collector's pieces as far back as a hundred thousand years ago. So collecting seashells, which my mother, by the way, absolutely loves to do, is still a huge deal and it has been a huge deal for ancient prehistory. These are very hard. The calcium is not going to go away. The pieces of shells that I'm holding right here, they're probably like thousands of years old in some cases. I'm not not even kidding. We'll look at some of these really old pieces such as this guy right here. And he is a very 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 old piece of large large thick seashell sea shell. There we go, the tongue twisters are starting. But you can see how it's riddled with holes. Well, once upon a time, this very thick seashell looked more like this guy right here. And you can see how huge this shell is, like how thick it is. That's one of the things I love with the diversity of seashells is when you look at it, you can see the diversity of the animal life, basically, and their needs and how big they can get. And to grow your shell, what the mollusks do is they gather the calcium from the seawater around them and they excrete it out of their bodies in a very, very slow process that grows the shells from the inside out. So they don't grow the exterior. The exterior of the shell is the oldest part of the shell. And the interior will be the newer part where it has recently excreted lots and lots of calcium. And that takes a long time to build up. If you guys remember when we talked about coral, these coral pieces take ages, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years to get to those big giant barrier reefs, the really big impressive coral pieces. And that's partly because these guys are little individual communities. Each little tube is an individual who lived and died and then had its clone or um, another one of its kind grow on top of it and continue growing this piece of coral. 
Well, this guy is all on his own. He was one of a kind. Uh, didn't have the community that the coral does, but he's still huge. He must be very old, because think about calcium structures. Let's think about bones, eggs, um, seashells, coral. Uh, even the calcium in limestone that creates the stalactites and stalagmites in caves. Thousands of years. Those take thousands of years to grow. So I have no idea how old this buddy may have been, but he's very thick, and that's one of the ways that you can tell that it's going to be an old one. And it's also very large. This almost fits in the entire palm of my hand. This is a piece that I actually got off of Ocracoke Island, off of North Carolina. But let's compare him with some more traditional pieces that you might see, like this guy. So this is more what most people think of when they think of common seashells. Just a little clam shell. Little or a scallop. I have difficulty telling the difference between the two. The scallops tend to be more highly arched with their ridges. And, nope, actually I think the scallops have the angel wing pieces. See, I can't remember the difference. My mother would know though. She loves it. I just love admiring the texture, the color, the differences. But look at this little guy. Even he's probably very old. And it's not even that thick, but compare him to this thing. Look at that. I've always thought that's so impressive. But they range in sizes. So you can have your very, very old guys over here. You can have your very tiny guys that make large structures, like the coral pieces. Here's some more examples of coral pieces. These are coral pieces from Hawaii right here. I believe these ones are from the Caribbean islands. I can't recall for sure. And actually, the thing is, this was obtained by um, a great aunt and great uncle of mine, who I think have since passed away. And when they went on a, a Caribbean cruise and they brought back all sorts of fun things for us and they gave me a couple pieces of coral. Who knows if that is really from the Caribbean though because that's a tourist sort of thing. So often you'll actually go to tourist places even when we went to Ocracoke Island which is one of the best shelling locations on the east coast of the United States and these are all shells that I found on the beach myself. But even on Ocracoke Island, there were stores that sold buckets, entire giant barrels and buckets full of like um, five cent, ten cent, dollar for each shells that were beautiful, beautiful shells. And none of them were native to Ocracoke. And that was one of the things that not a lot of people will know. Where you do have um, the tourists come to look for shells, often you'll have the people selling the shells, and those shells are probably not native to the area if they're in a shop. So that's, like all of these, these are all ochre coke shells, but a lot of the ones we'd see in stores, we knew those species didn't exist anywhere near us. Also, we have a, a fun little bird. Hi, little guy, you saying hello? You want some of my seashells? He is right there. <laughs> he wants the bird feeder, that's what he wants. But yeah, the, and one of the things that you can really tell about regional shells, these guys, the ochre coat shells, are over here. And it's very rare that I would find any of these bright ones. The coloration of shells depends not only on what species they are, but what nutrients are available in the areas that they lived in. So, and also, these shells from Ocracoke, we learned um, the island, Ocracoke is an island off the north coast, or uh, off the coast of North Carolina, and we learned that these particular shells were swept up under the island as, as tectonic plates moved and wrapped up in mud, a lot of thick layers of mud for several, like, thousands of years, and then the plates moved back again and these shells popped back out. And that's why they have this black coloration is because they're from that era, they were under the mud for so long, and possibly because of whatever they were eating at the time that they, they grew, at whatever time that the mollusk was growing that shell. So it's pretty interesting to look at all of them and you can see the pattern in color. And then compare that to the pattern in color that you can see over here. These are shells from Hawaii, and you can see a huge difference immediately in the species, their shapes, their structures, and especially their fun little hints of color. Look at that, the bright, vibrant colors, the like more tropical look to them. This one, These ones right here are shells from Jamaica, and you can see each and every group looks different. The coral from Jamaica looks very different from the coral from Hawaii, from the coral from the Caribbean, and they're 
actually isn't any coral that I could find of any type that was on the beach in Ocracoke. I'm not saying it's not there, I just didn't get my hands on it. This is the closest we come to something that looks like coral but is not coral. This is just a very old and eroded rock. But I love it. These are my specimens, and you may have noticed a very special specimen back here, this guy. This is a nautilus shell. So this is going to be one of your much larger mollusks who are still out in the ocean. This is not a, a shell of a dead, extinct creature. The, the nautili are still out there. They're still kicking. And they are very beautiful. These shells are stunningly beautiful. Then they're not, keep in mind, whenever an animal looks like this, it's kind of a coincidence that we find it so visually appealing, artistically appealing, because it's just trying to do its best to live. But the big old mollusk will be in here, and they'll kind of float like this through the ocean and gather up their food. But these guys are usually collected by fishermen who are doing trawling in the water. And they get kind of caught up in, the, in all of the fishing, cleaned out, and their cells sh sold for a lot of money. Uh, this one was about 40 US dollars. It's average price for this size, this kind. It's not polished, so there's three layers to seashells. And you can see how thin this one is too. So he is huge, but what his size may have been a sacrifice for some degree of protection. Because I bet it's going to be harder to eat this guy than it would be to eat this guy. But yeah, I like him. This is a beautiful Nautilus shell. We'll probably look in it at more depth in the future. Talk about the Nautilus, talk about where you can find them, what their role in the ecosystem is. Uh, oh, they're just, they're so cool. But, and then this is a moon shell. And these are my favorites. These are baby ears. This is a huge specimen. Absolutely lovely. Beautiful baby ear specimen. But shells, they have fascinated people. They have been part of collections for, like I said, hundreds, uh, over 100,000 years. People have been collecting seashells, giving them value, uh, giving them meaning, and just admiring how beautiful they are. And that is... It's something really lovely. So there's something very ancient about our relationship with seashells. And there's also something a little troubling in the way that seashells, because of their beauty, just like all the other beautiful things in the natural world, are so coveted to the point where they can be over-harvested. Because don't forget, each of these shells that you see, once upon a time was a living creature. This is not a rock. These are not rocks. They are the remains, the history, of a creature that lived and died a long time ago. And there are still seashells out there that are very, very rare, that sell for a lot of money, that are hard to get, and people will pay a lot of money for them. So you can have exploitation over harvesting of those species to the point where some of them have theoretically been driven into extinction. It's so hard to find them anymore that, you know, they just think that some species might be extinct. And don't forget, often you'll have other species come along on what you think is just a dead seashell, what's the harm of taking it home? And they will colonize it and they will make it their home. You can see a ton of little barnacles here. So it's just like a dead tree that's fallen in the woods in a way. Somebody else is going to come along and use some material. So it's a good idea to try to be respectful. And in the, this case, we were on a total shell hunt and there's not going to be a lot of creatures using these particular kinds of shells. But where you have shells that provide a lot of protection, then, like, somebody else wants to move in here. Hermit crabs rely on seashells that, wa that wash up on their islands in order to have protection and shelter. And if people come along and collect all of those seashells, then there's not going to be any way for them to have that vital shelter that they have evolved to need. They're codependent on those shells for survival. <laughs> so you really want to be careful not to take too much. I'm... I'm a big believer in the best thing you can take is pictures. And if you're going to take something, then make sure that you share what you have with people like I am so that they can appreciate and admire and look at just the diversity of life in this world and hopefully get something from it. So I hope you guys have gotten something from this. This is just kind of a quick overview of my seashells as I begin to go through my collections and decide um, what I'm going to take with me to our new home and what I'm going to leave behind. And what I do leave behind, I'm actually going to probably most of these, for example. 
I'm going to box them up and give them to one of the local children's uh, areas, children's free play areas who take care of kids for free for parents who work so that the kids can have an opportunity to hold the seashells, look at them, learn from them, and hopefully gain quite a bit of curiosity in, in the world around them. So I hope you guys are doing well, and I hope that this sparked a little bit of your curiosity. And, I mean, just look at this. How could you not look at some of these things and not want to go and find out where they're from and learn more about the world where this little creature calls home? So, I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye!